to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Father, we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus, you'll help us to understand your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. So, we start off then, um, after these things, the various things that's been happening, the, the healing um, of the centurion's um, son, um, and he's gone up to Jerusalem. So he's moved from Galilee to up to Jerusalem. We say up to Jerusalem, of course, because always when you go to Jerusalem, whether it's north, south, east, or west, you go up to Jerusalem. Um, so for the Jewish mindset. So these things then, was a, there was a feast of the Jews. Um, so we don't know exactly when, uh, which festival this was. Um, it's likely to be the Passover, and if it is, it's, it's the second Passover we have um, in Jesus' ministry, and it will be there for about one and a half years into his ministry. John is not written chronologically, so we, we can see that through the work of Luke, which was written chronologically in time order. So Jesus then went up to Jerusalem. There were three feasts. You go up to Jerusalem, uh, typically to the temple. For your sacrifice, make your sacrifices. So Jesus is going up, as was the practice. Um, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool. The sheep gate would be a place where the sheep would be entering, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. So the word Bethesda means house of grace. It had five porticos, and in these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, withered waiting for the moving of the waters. Now, I have to indicate here, at the end of verse 3, waiting for the moving of the waters, and carrying on to verse 4, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever would then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well, um, for whatever the disease, whatever disease which was he was afflicted. That part... Um, is not in the original text. It has it in the King James Version, but it's not in the original manuscript. So the Revised Version and other versions will either have it omitted or will have it bracketed to say that it wasn't in the original. At some point early on, somebody has then added to that. The aspect of people being healed is not a problem because later on, it says that there was waters were stirred up. But actually how the waters were stirred up, we don't know what the original manuscripts, uh, they don't indicate why, but this was inserted. It's interesting to note that in 1888, there was a St. Anne's church convent was, uh, dis was um, restored. And in there, and that's in, the, in Jerusalem, they found a large, pool of water um, and on this on the wall by this pool of water there was a picture of an angel stepping down to uh, move the waters um, so whether that's relevant or not we don't know but there's clearly been an historical um, idea going back a long time that there was an angel coming down focusing then on the word Bethesda the Hebrew Bethesda house of grace the house of grace the word grace is this idea of undeserved favor to have a house of grace is this idea that people were expecting that here you're going to have something that's going to be given to you that you don't deserve and clearly we have all of these people arriving who weren't very well to say the least they were the sick the blind the lame the withered those people who had um, weren't able to move their feet, their legs, their arms, or whatever. They're, they're unable to move themselves. So they are very vulnerable. And in that society, um, you would hope that God would have mercy on them and heal them. But note here that they didn't go to the temple. Under the law, the Levites weren't allowed to be a, a, any def, a, any, anything wrong with their body at all. So there was a, maybe a harshness maybe towards those people who weren't perfect. But also we remember that Jesus talked about the parable 
um, of the Good Samaritan, where at that time he said that a Levite might walk past or a religious person might walk past somebody who was suffering and not have any compassion because of religious duties. And we have indicated here then that there's possibly this is going on. You've got these people who are blind, um, sick and lame and withered, who deserve compassion and empathy, but they've been left. And this man, they've been left for 38 years. People obviously had seen him for 38 years. People in Jerusalem, religious people, where the center of religion was for the Jewish people. But they'd walked past these people. And note, he said, nobody had actually helped me to get into the pool. Even though you don't necessarily know how to heal somebody through prayer, at least you could pick the person up and maybe try and help him in some way. Maybe they were saying, oh, maybe this is not a particularly um, godly way of healing. Maybe the religious people were maybe a little unhappy with this practice. They wanted to go to the temple because God would be the one to heal. But these people had gone here because they'd heard that this is a place where you could be healed by the waters. And we find that in our, throughout history, humans have a way of, in their desperation, crying out for any means to be healed and any means of health and overcoming difficulties. These people didn't know where to turn. They were desperate. And so they'd heard that these waters had been moved and that they could be healed. We hear that people in our present world, we turn to medication for healing people. And people are looking to be healed through medication. But also there are also lots of alternative medications, whether it's the Chinese medicine, whether it's acupuncture, or um, for the mind, people try to, all over the place, people are talking about mindfulness. Um, and yoga and all different ways to try to, to get some healing. People turn to drugs and alcohol and other forms um, to try to heal their mind from their brokenness of their mind and um, emotional difficulties just to face another day. The world is full of it. People crying out in sickness. And those people who are supposed to be the priests of God, the Levites, who are supposed to be able to serve the sick and the blind, the needed to have compassion on God's creation. They're walking past. They're walking past the blind. They're walking past the needy. They're doing it year after year after year after year. Maybe there's a reflection on us as the church. We've been given the gospel. We've been given the good news, which is God's answer to sin and also can bring healing for the soul as well as for eternal well-being. How often has the church throughout history not gone out into the world where the sick, the blind, the withered, for years after years, hundreds of years, have been languishing in their sickness of sin? Because ultimately, sickness goes right the way back to the curse. In the Garden of Eden, there was no sickness. Everybody was well. Adam and Eve were well and strong. Because of the taking of the knowledge of good and evil, God had to then bring the curse. There was a curse upon the land, upon the ground, by the sweat of your brow. There was entropy. Death entered. There was a beginning of death. And as a result, then you've got death and sickness on the ground. And therefore... We see in the Bible there are occasions where people who do bad things are punished by God because of their behaviour, but also we know that there is a, there is a problem with, um, with nature of sickness and disease. So sin can cause sickness as well as disease can be caused by a natural fault as a result of entropy, as a result of the curse on the ground. So all various different reasons why people get sick. As well as we know from Job, there can be spiritual reasons going on. That the enemy, there is Satan in the Bible, can look to try to bring people down through sickness. And God can allow that sometimes to happen to test our faith. 
uh, detest people or whatever. So various different reasons why people are sick. We don't know. There's not just one reason. But we do know it's a result of a relationship that's broken between God and man, is the original origin of it. And so we have this house of grace that's been created, a religious centre, if you like, looking for healing. We don't know whether God sent an angel to stir the waters or not. We, we have no indication. We know that God could do it if he wanted to, but we don't know. Or it could be of some kind of pagan, kind of religious thing that's outside of God's will. What can be said is that these people are very needy and the religious people aren't doing what they should be doing. So there's a separate house of grace, whereas the temple should be the house of grace. They should be at the temple, but something happened long before because in Ezekiel it says that God was so angry with the way that the Jews were worshipping other gods and not practicing the Sabbaths, that he then cast them out. Well, actually, before that, he left the Shekinah glory, the glory of God, departed from the temple, and then left, departed. And so the temple was just a building, and people were just going through the, the routine of religious practices. But God himself, the power of God, was not there in, present, in the present. And then they were led into captivity. When they came back from captivity, they remember in Zechariah, they were fasting because they had lost their temple. And they came up to um, Zechariah, they, they were asking, should we carry on fasting? And God answered, it's not, should we still fast because we're rebuilding the temple? It's not about, you shouldn't be sorry about the temple when you fast. You're fasting should be because you haven't got your relationship right with God. And we read about how the people then, Nehemiah, started writing because they wanted to get right with God, lots and lots of rules about how to get right with God, to stay right with God. It all started with the right intentions. See, the temple was key, but they started to rebuild the temple, and at the same time they wanted to get it right by God, so they started <coughs> preparing Rules regarding how you should behave and the Sabbath behaviour. Started with good intentions, protect the Sabbath. If we keep the Sabbath right, then we won't go wrong. But that built up and built up over the years. And so there were lots and lots of, there's 39 different categories of things that you have to obey, on the, for the, to obey the Sabbath. It started off as a place which should have been for God, with worship for God, but it's, it then lived ironically for the Sabbath, to become a thing of worship itself, to keep the Sabbath. And they have the Queen of the Sabbath. The Jewish people welcome, welcoming the Queen of the Sabbath, and then they say goodbye to the Queen of the Sabbath at the end. Some, something that's far from actually this, the, just a simple adoration and worship of God. You've got something else being brought up to that instead. So going back here then, we've got this person then. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that con condition. So Jesus knew that he had already been a long time in that condition. Well, here we have this idea of God, Jesus, being omniscient. He sees and knows everything. Before we even ask, he knows. Before the foundation of the earth, he knew everything and knows everything. We saw that with, when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman. He knew that she'd be married five times. He knows things that, um, like Nathaniel, he was saying, I know, I saw you under the tree. He knows things that, humanly, you can't possibly know. And he shows that he knew this man. He knows your situation. He knows my situation. He knows our family situation. We don't have to tell him. He knows everything. He's looking, what's he looking for? He's looking for a right response to him. What does he want? He wants us to be humble. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to have justice, mercy, faithfulness, rather than worrying about all the lots of different laws and rules and regulations. What are we as believers in Jesus? How should we live? We should live with the same heart that Jesus is. Now here we see the heart of Jesus. Jesus went full of grace 
and truth into the house of grace here. Like he went to the Samaritan woman. He went to these people who were broken, who were rejected, discarded. And he showed the, the, what God is like. Jesus shows what God is like. How do we know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Look what he did. Here he went to the Samaritan woman and he spoke truth into her life. And the Samaritans, the rejected, were saved. Here he goes into a place where people were rejected. No one had any time for them. All the religious people, they were so busy with doing their religious stuff. They overlooked these people who were broken and desperately needy. He went in there and he spoke to this man. And he asked him, do you wish to get well? Wanting a response, because of course the man wants to get well, but he wants a response. He asked the question to get a response from us. And the sick man answered, instead of saying, yes, of course he wants to get well, he, he was looking to the back maybe for help. Sir, he didn't know who Jesus was. Had no clue who this man was. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. Well, while I'm coming, another steps down before me. I'm weak. I'm desperately needy. I've got no one to help me. Maybe you can help carry me. Maybe he's thinking, maybe Jesus can carry me into the waters. But Jesus has something better. Better than the waters. Better than religion. Better than drugs. Better than alcohol. Better than yoga. Better than mindfulness. Better than anything that humans can ever provide or any religion can provide. Because religion is all about what you can try to do for God. For the Muslims, working to try and keep all the five pillars and then keeping all of those rules. Um, the, for the Jewish people, trying to keep the 613 commands under the law. Um, for, Jewish, for Hindus, trying to establish kind of a, a relationship to deal with getting good karma. For Buddhists, trying to get rid of your, your desire. All of sorts of different ways that religions are trying to accomplish something whereas here we have in the scripture, in the house of grace, God comes to us. And this is the amazing thing. Where with a sickness abounding and horror of the world that we're living in, at times, because God wants to lift, be glorified, he steps into time and space and he reveals himself. And today, He's doing it through you and through me, through the church. The church is that window of opportunity for the world, for the sick, the broken, to see Jesus. We are his hands and feet on the earth through the Holy Spirit's leading. We have that responsibility to go out into the world and to speak the good news. Because where this man, he says, um, the next verse, he says, Sorry, verse 8, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. It's just like that man that was taken, dropped through the roof. And he said, pick up um, your pallet and walk. Because before that, they were asking about, I tell you, your sins can be forgiven. I said, your sins can be forgiven? And, and they were questioning whether he could say your sins are forgiven. He said, well, I can do the harder. I can tell you to get up and walk. Tell the man to get up and walk. And so he said, get up and walk. Because he was showing that he could actually forgive sins. And here we have not just a, so an outward physical healing. We also here have a spiritual healing. He's telling him to get up, pick up your pallet and walk. There's a spiritual healing as well as a physical. The world and Satan can offer healings. Can provide some kind of overcoming of physical ailments and mental ailments. But Jesus can provide the right relationship with the Father that brings an eternal healing, the full shalom, holistic well-being for eternity. And that's what we, as followers of Jesus, have the ability to do, the grace to be able to do that in his name. Because we were like that man. We were like him in our sin. But in time and space, for some reason, we don't know, there were lots of people there, but Jesus focused on this man. And he had compassion on this man. Why? Because he's led by the Holy Spirit. Why did the Holy Spirit lead him there? Because the, he was on the Father's heart before the foundation of the earth. 
We don't know, but only the Father knows. He homes in on this one person to show the grace. Jesus didn't go to the whole of them. He could have if he wanted to. All of you, have some grace, be healed. And the whole lot, be healed. The whole of Jerusalem, be healed. The whole of Israel, be healed. The whole of the world, be healed. But he didn't. He just goes to this one man. And he's showing through the Gospel of John, we're reading, he goes into time and space and he selects individuals that he's predestined before the foundation of the earth. We don't understand everything, but we do know that he, he's particular about his acts of grace. And you have received that grace. And you are also then, being followers of Jesus, can go into your world and be led by the Holy Spirit and be at times just led when you can actually speak God's word of grace to encourage the person to have faith. Now here we have this man who didn't have faith, he didn't know who Jesus was, but the power of God spoke to him. And so, immediately, he picked up his pallet and began to walk. And it says now, it was on the Sabbath on that day. And here we have another thing. So that's Jesus moving with grace, the, the God of grace. Here we have Jesus, the Shekinah glory that left, departed from the temple is Jesus. Jesus departed from the temple. And here we have, here he is in Jerusalem, walking into the house of grace where all of these people sit. Here we have the Shekinah glory of God here manifesting himself through the healing of this man. But it's on the Sabbath. Why should that be a problem? We just said, didn't we, before, that the Sabbath is a particular day that the Jewish people have set apart that you've got to be seen as holy. And if you do any work on that day, you're going to break God's rule because God and the sixth day in Genesis chapter 2 said that's the day where God rests. And in Deuteronomy and in Exodus, Leviticus as well, they're told you mustn't do any work because it's a sign. In Exodus 31, it's a sign that you're holy. You're not allowed to do any work on that day. And so they've got lots of different rules not to do any work. And one of the things you're not allowed to do is pick up anything, carry anything, or walk on the Sabbath. So the rules have become very, very important for them. However, there was an exception to those rules. The Jews had, if in case of danger to life, you can overcome, you don't need to worry about it. But they were so caught up in the rules, we can see here, they ignored the fact that this man had been taken from his desperately powerless situation and suddenly been given the power to walk and make a life for himself. Here, he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. So he said, it's Jesus. He didn't know who it was, the man who's in ignorance, it's the man. But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd. So maybe there was a fuss. Behold, you have become, sorry, later on, so Jesus then later on found him and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. That goes back to this idea. Potentially, it could be read that he'd done something wrong, which he caused, caused it. Or maybe, if you carry on sinning, something might happen to you. You might have some sickness to you. We're not, not too sure. But the, the Pharisees, um, they were upset. Who is the man who said, Pick up the pallet and walk? The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So Jesus then had gone back to the temple. So here we see he found him in the temple. So he went from the house of grace to the temple area to give thanks to God. Maybe he went to give some money, but he'd gone there to give thanks maybe. He went to God's house. Um, and that's where he met Jesus. And he then, he told the Jews, then the, the leaders... Pharisees, that it was Jesus who had made him well. So, one of the problems, if you do break the Sabbath, one of the punishments was death. You can be killed for breaking it. So, maybe he was saving his own neck, but at the same time, maybe he was putting Jesus in a difficult spot. So, that's what the situation was. So, he went and told the Jews who had made him well. For this reason, then, the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So we know from uh, the other um, synoptic Gospels that Jesus had been doing lots of miracles. And John says if, uh, he'd written everything down, 
there wouldn't be enough room to write it all down, all the amazing things Jesus was doing. So we just want what, this one instance that Je we were shown of what Jesus was doing. So he was doing many things, and he was doing them on the Sabbath. The Sabbath when the Lord rests. But he answered, my father is working. So this is Jesus' message to us about the Sabbath and the day of rest. My father is working. So he's finished the working of creation. He finished that in six days. So what's he working on? Well, we know from what Jesus said, shared, he's building a bride for his son. He's also looking to bring Israel into that place of repentance. So the father is working, we know from scripture, on the judgment on Israel and the world, but also at this time, Isaiah 61, the year of the Lord's favour. He's bringing grace to the world and to the nations, as well as to the Jewish people. So my father is working until now, he's working now, he's not stopped. Why? Because it's the Sabbath, which is a day of rest. No, you need to know the Father is working now, today, in my presence. The Father is working, even though it's a Sabbath. And I, myself, am working, relating himself to God. Which means, you and I, as Jesus with the Great Commission, calls us to step in to his work. We are doing God's work when we step into, by grace, through the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, the Great Commission. We are part of that. But the people who were not part of it, they were then his enemies. They weren't with him, so they were against him. They didn't want him to do this healing. So they weren't happy that this man had been healed. They were more worried about the fact that they'd broken the Sabbath. Because if people break the Sabbath, maybe the Israel will come, come under judgment and they'll be put into exile again. So they were very keen and hot for their nation to be holy, overlooking the individual. God is a God of love, a God of compassion. He's not looking for lots of rules. He look, he's looking for that faithfulness. But God's faithfulness is that covenant that he's got with Israel is all about love and care for individuals. And here we see it's not about an, what we can do for God. We're trying to be perfect for God so he doesn't judge us. The view should be, thank you for your grace, your love, your compassion, your kindness. Now I've received that, I want to share that. I'm a beggar that's found the food. I now want to join you, Lord Jesus, in sharing where to find the food for the others. So for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was seeing himself as equal with God. And that's what separates the followers of Jesus from all of the other religions, from all of the other cults, Jehovah Witnesses, for example, the Mormons, um, and for the Muslims. Well, they've got lots of different Jesuses. But there's only one biblical Jesus, and he has chosen you in time and space to reveal his healing power through the gospel. He's provided us with a wonderful opportunity in our lives, because our lives, we get one chance, and then we're facing, for us, once we receive Jesus, heavenly glory, but those who are outside face judgment. So we have a huge opportunity in order to go into the house of grace, because the house of grace today is the world. We're still in the day of the Lord's favour and to share the good news of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wonderful grace through the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that the Shekinah glory the Lord Jesus, Christ in us, is now our hope of glory. Thank you, we were like that man, broken in sin. 
but you've come into our lives and granted us healing through your mercy, your grace, your love. And you've granted us power through the Holy Spirit. Grant us, Father, your grace and mercy and understanding of your gospel that we might go into the world today to share with our friends, our family, with our enemies, with all those in the world who don't know you, that we might share the light of your love and that your name might be glorified now and forever. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.